Delighted to be here, Julian Zelizer, author of the brilliantly timed, as well as brilliantly written, Fierce Urgency of Now. Um, and um, we're going to talk for a while and then take your questions, and I hope you'll all buy multiple copies of his book. Um, all right, Julian. Yes. So the conventional narrative, perhaps, one might say, of the great society is kind of the great man theory. The, the Robert Caro, Lyndon Johnson created this through force of personality. That's not the thesis of your book. Your book is much more focused on Congress. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, for, for many uh, decades, everyone looked at Lyndon Johnson as, as the worst president. And uh, until the recent revival, he was the guy who brought us Vietnam. He was the guy who destroyed the country, destroyed his legacy. Recently, there's been a revival. And he's the quintessential example now of how a great leader, a great man, a single person, the president, can really drive the agenda and change the nation. Uh, and so I don't want to challenge that Lyndon Johnson was a very good politician and very skillful and effective, but I want to say it takes a lot more than that, especially on Capitol Hill, to actually have that kind of success. And so rather than Lyndon Johnson uh, uh, being the explanation for why so much happens in 1965 and 1966, I talk about how the civil rights movement, how voters in the election of 1964 create a Congress that temporarily is willing, is determined, is eager, is demanding big changes in health care, education, voting rights, uh, and then how that window closes and renders Johnson pretty ineffective uh, when he no longer has that Congress. Well, now, I might as well get to the point, which is the movie, uh -huh. uh, and which I have not seen, yes. uh, but you have. And, and, and there is this controversy now about you know, who gets more credit. Uh, does Johnson deserve more credit? Is Johnson neglected in this movie? Is the civil rights movement slighted in some ways? It came up during Hillary Clinton's, uh, when she ran for president in 2008, where she talked about Lyndon Johnson's. How do you... I mean, allocate credit, talk about the, the differences in who was responsible for the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. So the movie Selma is out, uh, and, and I urge people to see it. It's actually, overall, my response is it's a tremendous film uh, that captures uh, both the process and dangers and courage of organizing, but also part of what I want to convey in the book that the movement often drove Washington. Uh, and it was often the movement, it was often the protests that were allowing things to happen in Washington. And, and that's really at the heart of the film. Well, well, but explain that a little bit. What does that mean that the, the movement forced Washington? How did that work? Well, the story with Lyndon Johnson is uh, Johnson wanted voting rights by January 1965. That's where the movie's wrong. Uh, a, a month earlier, he already had his attorney general, Nick Katzenbach, draft the legislation. Uh, and by February, he would be having negotiations with Senator Dirksen uh, in Dirksen's office uh, over the details of a bill. So Johnson was very much committed to a bill. He wanted it. He believed in it. He accepted the movement's uh, arguments. That said, he didn't think it was time to pass this in early 1965. He was worried it would tie up his whole agenda. He wouldn't get Medicare. He wouldn't get education assistance. He was worried a lot of moderate uh, Democrats would get too scared about trying to do two civil rights bills so close together. And King and the movement said, we're not going to wait. Uh, and there's a conversation which you can hear this play out where Johnson says, I want this, but I'm not going to get this through Congress. I can't. Uh, Johnson understood the limits of his power more than anyone. Uh, and King is like, we can't wait because every time we wait on legislation, it doesn't happen. Uh, wait, pragmatism, incremental politics was the death often of civil rights bills. So he wanted it now. And what happens, the marches take place in March of 1965. And by March 15th, members of Congress are telling Lyndon Johnson, if you don't pass up, put something to us, we're going to propose it on our own. The pressure within the White House is overwhelming. And Johnson makes his speech on March 15th calling on Congress to pass a civil rights bill. So timing, which is really significant in American politics, it's not simply another esoteric issue, uh, was at the heart of the debate. And the movement really forced uh, uh, the president to act much earlier than he hoped to, and we had a bill as a result. Now, what, one of the most interesting parts I thought of the book was the uh, place of the Republican Party. I guess, in part, 
because it's so different from the Republican Party of today. And there are, in many respects, two key figures. There's Everett Dirksen in the Senate, and in the House, I'm forgetting his name from Ohio, the uh, guy. McCulloch. McCulloch, oh, McCulloch. Uh, who I, I first heard of when I read Todd Purdom's quite yep. excellent book about just about the Civil Rights Act, very sort of unsung figure in American history. Talk about the role of the Republicans in getting all this through, in particular, the, the crucial issue of getting through a filibuster. Well, without Republican support, uh, you wouldn't have uh, either a civil rights or voting rights bill. So uh, basically, the Democrats were divided in this period between Southern Democrats, who were very powerful in Congress. They controlled the committees, uh, and they opposed civil rights. Uh, and Northern Democrats, who were liberal, they were progressive, they were pushing for the Great Society about a decade earlier, before Johnson was ever president. Uh, and so what they could do in the Senate, the South, even though their numbers weren't a majority, they could filibuster. And they could filibuster bills, which they did all the time, uh, until they were defeated. Uh, so one of the ways around a filibuster was to gain Republican votes. And Johnson needed that if he was going to succeed. So uh, within the Republican Party, you had liberal Republicans like a Jacob Javits, who were more progressive on issues like race than most Democrats. But you also had leaders like Senator Everett Dirksen, the Senate Minority Leader, uh, or William McCullough, who was a key member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, who for various reasons by 64 and 65 came around to the cause of civil rights. McCullough had supported civil rights for many decades. Uh, Dirksen was more hesitant, but he was convinced, like many people by the movement, that the time had come. Uh, and so Dirksen ultimately will deliver about 25 votes. Uh, when the Southerners are filibustering civil rights and helps to end, uh, end that filibuster. And with voting rights, as I said, he helps to negotiate a bill, Dirksen, before the protests ever start. They basically have an agreement uh, because he and Nicholas Katzenbach worked out a bill. Uh, so there wasn't a significant filibuster against voting rights. So the, the GOP was really, if, if Obama had the, I mean, if Johnson had the kind of GOP uh, that the current president faces, it would have been a very different story. These were key votes. What was in it for Dirksen? I mean, what, why, why, you know, why, I, I guess, you know, we are all prisoners of our own time. I mean, you know, I, I think about the contentious relationship between the, the Republicans and the president where, you know, denying the president a victory is a goal in and of itself. I mean, Dirksen had to know that this would be a tremendous achievement for President Johnson. Why, why would Dirksen you know, yep. go to bat in such an important way? He did. I, and a lot of issues, he still wanted to deny the president victories. It's important to remember the Republicans were not all on board with the Great Society. Uh, part of the reason was he was a, a true legislator. This was a period where a lot of these guys, including Johnson, measured their success by great legislation. And I think by the mid-60s, Dirksen realized this would be part of his legacy as well, uh, his own legacy and the legacy of the party. Part of it is politics. He, Dirksen, was being pressured by civil rights activists, and many Republicans were, uh, to support this bill. Uh, as the debates uh, are taking place on both bills, civil rights activists are protesting in cities like Chicago. They are threatening many times to protest uh, at Dirksen's personal home in Illinois, where he didn't actually live, but his mother-in-law did. Uh, but to embarrass him and force the issue, religious leaders were very important. During Talk, this just period. let me stop you right yep. there, because that I think is it, it, that was also very interesting yep. to me. You know, again, coming out of our world, religious, we think of evangelical, we think of conservative, we think of Pat Robertson, uh, Jerry Falwell. In fact, religious leaders, and we're not talking about the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, not the African American okay. Church leaders. We're talking about the white, the Methodists, the Presbyterians were important in this fight. Hugely important in both civil rights fights and some of these other pieces of legislation. Uh, relatively liberal uh, religious leaders from the Midwest were instrumental because in many of these states, uh, African Americans did not have the clout to uh, totally shift the opinion of a Republican, but a religious leader did. They had a lot of sway in the community. Personally, they had a lot of sway with members of Congress. and. They did all sorts of things. Uh, in 64, they come to Washington and they have a vigil uh, to raise attention for the need to end uh, the civil rights filibuster. Religious leaders come and lobby and talk to members of Congress. Uh, 
uh, uh, throughout a lot of these debates. National religious associations coordinate with local preachers uh, to have certain messages and sermons and to encourage congregants uh, to write uh, their members and tell them to support the bill. And many Republicans said that was really important to turning a lot of members of the GOP who didn't care about civil rights, some of whom were not in favor of legislation, but realized that politically it was turning disastrous for them not to support this. Well, I mean, a question I had, and maybe yeah. this is an unfair question to you, because it's, it's a little beyond the scope of your book, is I read that and I think, well, where'd they go? Uh -huh. Like, where, where, where are right. these religious leaders now? I mean, like, you know, yep. look, what happened to them as a, as a political force? I mean, I don't, I, it's not like I think they're, pushing in a different direction. They just seem absent from politics. Yeah, there was a little I remember in 2008, and I can't remember his name. I, I did a talk with him. He was a kind of liberal religious leader, uh, maybe I'll remember later, who was behind, uh, uh, who was part of the campaign in 2008 for oh, Obama I know who you're talking and about. trying yeah. to mobilize. But it, it fades. It, it's very notable, the presence of uh, liberal religious figures in this period. You know, there's a whole coalition of liberalism. It's not just religious leaders that will fade. And it's an important part of the story. Uh, you have the union movement, uh, which is very large at this point, 30% of the workforce. The AFL-CIO is a major force in Washington that's pushing behind many bills, not simply bills directly related to labor, including civil rights. You have the civil rights movement. You have this now missing uh, kind of liberal religious constituency. And they're constantly not only building pressure at the grassroots, but lobbying in Washington and doing the hard work uh, of getting legislators to turn their vote from a no to a yes. And so we've seen how that faded in religion. I don't know what happened. Obviously, part of it, they were surpassed in the 70s uh, by the evangelical right, which became a more powerful force. But a lot of the components of this liberal coalition in the 60s uh, started to disintegrate. Uh, but it's really important understanding why a lot of this was succeeding in the mid-1960s. Johnson depended on them, just like he depended on the Republicans. Sort of the, the, the haunting backdrop of your book, which comes, you know, comes up occasionally, is Vietnam. Yep. And talk about how Vietnam intersected with this con with, with the Great Society legislation. Well, the, you know, uh, Vietnam traditionally is, uh, is, is obviously treated as his great uh, failure, the, gr the disaster of his presidency. Uh, and, and part of what I convey in the book, uh, it was part of a bargain Vietnam. It wasn't simply that Johnson adhered to the domino idea that if one country fell to communism, others would follow. Uh, part of the reason he keeps getting deeper and deeper into Vietnam is Johnson fears politically that for any liberal Democrat to succeed, you had to be a hawk on national security. And there's many key moments when these political concerns of his are front and center. Gulf and Tonkin. Gulf of Tonkin takes place right in the middle of the 1964 election. Barry Goldwater has spent the summer railing against him uh, for being weak on defense and uh, not willing uh, to stand up to the communists. And part of the conversations he has surrounding the Gulf of Tonkin is he wants to show not just the Vietnamese, uh, the North Vietnamese, but show the American public he is going to be tough on defense and he can be a hawk uh, if necessary. And the political concerns are uh, incredibly explicit in a lot of the phone conversations. Johnson and Democrats of his era were all shaped by the 1952 election where Republicans won the White House and they won Congress in part on the issue of uh, Korea and communism. And Johnson's always worried that if, if he looks weak, they're going to get him on that uh, kind of issue. So, so part of Vietnam that I talk about is this political bargain he makes to protect his coalition on domestic policy. He accepts this incremental acceleration of a war that actually kills a lot of what he wants to do. The second way in which it's relevant is after the 66 midterms, when conservatives regain their strength on Capitol Hill, the, one of the biggest issues they use against him is the budget and the costs uh, of the war in the great society. And the, the final chapter of my book is all about the guns and butter debate, uh, where conservatives in Congress basically say, if you want money for Vietnam, you're going to have to cut domestic spending and domestic spending for the most vulnerable constituencies. Uh, and the cost of the war, you know, we know a lot about the anti-war movement and the college protests. But the real heart of Vietnam, at least in 67 and 68, is about the budget 
and it's about how the right, how conservatives, use the cost against him. Uh, and this becomes the dominant issue of his final two years. So all around, it, 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 it's a bargain that uh, devastates him. Before we get to the 66 yep. elections, which I think are very, very critical, and let's talk a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid, yes. because that is not normally part of the sort of heroic narrative of the great society, which you know, understandably focuses on civil yep. rights. Where, where did that, those ideas come from, Medicare and Medicaid? Because I mean, just in terms of the vast influence, it's, it's just it's enormous. Yeah, I mean, uh, Medicare is, is the biggest breakthrough, you can argue, in social policy at that time. Uh, and the idea had been percolating for over a decade. Uh, it was really uh, coming from two sources. Liberal Democrats who had been coming into Congress since the 1950s uh, had been pushing for this. It was an alternative to national health care. Many believed after uh, President Truman unsuccessfully proposed national health care, this was the best uh, step to take next. Uh, it, was a, it was a more contained program, but significant. It dealt with a population that people saw as deserving, the elderly, and it would be financed and run through the Social Security program, uh, which was popular. Organized labor also was a strong supporter of, social, of Medicare. They even form a group that lobbies for it uh, and are pretty instrumental to it. Uh, the problem is it had a lot of opposition. So this conservative coalition in Congress uh, in this case, led by Wilbur Mills, who was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Democrat. kept saying, a Democrat, Southern Democrat, said no. Uh, and he wouldn't even let the bill come up for a vote between 1961 and 64. Uh, the AMA mounted a fierce campaign against Medicare, which in some ways makes the campaign against Obamacare uh, look timid. Uh, they called it socialized medicine. They were handing out pamphlets in the offices of physicians. Uh, warning that your next visit, people would pick it up, will be determined by a bureaucrat rather than your doctor who you just saw. They Ronald, mounted. Ronald Reagan. Ronald well, Reagan that, records of, a record yeah. against uh, Medicare where he says this is the first step to socialism. And the wives of physicians in local communities would have coffee clutches. And that's what they would, they would listen to Ronald Reagan. So it was a big campaign. And Medicare is top of the agenda. Kennedy wants it very much. Uh, and in contrast to a lot of images of Kennedy, he's pushing for it, but he can't get it through. Uh, and even after Kennedy's death, even when there's all this public sentiment uh, uh, about the assassination, the bill comes up again. The Senate tries to get it through uh, with an amendment to other legislation, and Mills kills it. He says, no way. It's not going to happen. Uh, so it's this big social uh, measure that's just dormant until the election of 64. Barry Goldwater runs, uh, and part of that campaign that Johnson mounts is to say Goldwater's against Medicare, I'm for it. And there's a lot of ads about this, uh, you know, vote for me. After the election, there's huge majorities. Uh, those majorities support Medicare. A lot of the new people elected ran on platforms that included Medicare. Wilbur Mills throws up his hands uh, by December of 64 and says, I'm going to support something. And in the first few months, he actually turns into uh, not just a, uh, someone who agrees to uh, push Medicare forward, Wilbur Mills, but actually helps craft a bill that's much bigger than anything the administration ever envisioned. And it will pass in that spring. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a watershed moment in social policy. Well, and in many respects, politically, the more remarkable thing is Medicaid yes. as opposed to Medicare. Because Medicare is for the elderly, who are generally a popular and certainly yep. numerous political constituency. Medicaid, yep. the only beneficiaries of Medicaid are poor people. How does that pass? Yeah, well, it was a small program. Most people weren't paying attention to it. Uh, it had been an existing program that passed in 1960. It wasn't called Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And when it passed in 60, it was a, a way originally to prevent Medicare. Conservatives basically pushed it forward, a small program just for the poor, and said this will be enough to siphon off support for anything bigger. Uh, but it's included in the 1965 legislation. It's still small. Most people don't talk about it during the debates. And in the following years, it would expand into a, yet another major health care program. Um, the, the 1966 election yep. is, is a big watershed, and it is a uh, disaster for the Democrats, and especially for the liberals. Do you think there's anything Johnson or the Democratic Party generally could have done to forestall 
um, lo a loss like that. Yeah, Johnson said no, and he loved to tell. So, so in that midterm election, Democrats retained control of Congress, but the balance between liberals and this conservative coalition shifts back to the conservatives. Democrats gained 47 seats in the House, uh, and the liberals. Uh, oh, wait, Democrat, in, the, in six. Republicans gained 47 seats right. in the House in 1966, and the balance shifts to that conservative coalition again. Um, and Johnson w was really upset and frustrated and realized his time was done, that he'd get some things through, but nothing like what had happened in the previous few years. Uh, he liked to explain it to people by saying, well, that's how midterms are, and uh, midterms go poorly. Uh, for presidents, and especially after a landslide like I enjoyed, this was inevitable. But obviously, you know, two issues were at the heart of the midterm. Uh, one was a racial backla a backlash against a civil rights bill that Johnson had proposed, a third civil rights bill. And what, what would that third civil rights bill have done? Fair housing. So oh, the, right. How, this yeah, was yeah. Uh, yeah. to prevent discrimination in the rent rental or sale of housing. Uh, and it was a pretty strong bill that he puts forward. Uh, and it causes a real backlash uh, among Democrats. Uh, one of the people who loses their seats because of this is Paul Douglas, a liberal from Illinois. Uh, he loses to a businessman, a very handsome businessman named Charles Percy, who's a moderate on civil rights, but capitalizes on this backlash in cities like Chicago. Uh, and you know, but actually, you're yeah. right about this. Why is housing sort of a bridge too far for the moderates? Why? Why do they? Why are they okay with voting rights? Why are they okay with you know accommodations, which is part of the Civil Rights Act? Why why does housing tip the balance a, a, you know in against Johnson's bill? Brings it to the north, and so uh, Richard Russell said you know he understood exactly why this was such a problem for Johnson because now the Northerners had to deal uh, with the issue of race relations. King actually moves to Chicago in 1966 to bring attention to this issue. And he says the violence that he saw in response to this uh, uh, surpassed anything that he had seen in the South. And I think that's the, you know, that is the reason. It dealt with property. It dealt with neighborhoods. And it was very contentious. Um, OK, so, so had that bill not been on the table, it might have diminished some of the sentiment. But Vietnam, again, was also an issue in well, the campaign. In which way did it cut in the campaign? It cut with conservatives attacking and not the left. So uh, Johnson couldn't care less, uh, less about the left at this point in his presidency. What he cared about was in 66, the right, Republicans, Southern Democrats were saying, our president is not tough enough on Vietnam. He's not willing to use enough force. He's not willing to bomb the North Vietnamese with everything that the United States has and he's going to lose. And they were also arguing that the budget was spiraling out of control. We were going to have inflation, huge deficits, and we needed some return to austerity. Uh, so Vietnam is another factor uh, that he couldn't have just stopped, but it was playing into the impact of the midterm. Um, what happens after 66? Because it's not nothing. Not nothing, and, and the housing bill will pass in 1968, two years after it's proposed. That's probably his biggest accomplishment in those years. Uh, but the final version, which passes after King's assassination, is a pale uh, version of what was proposed. It doesn't have any enforcement mechanism. It only includes a limited part of the housing stock. And it's really a symbolic measure to say we don't accept discrimination in housing, but it doesn't have the teeth of what was originally proposed. He has some other smaller measures on the was environment. Gun control yeah. after Robert Kennedy is yeah, assassinated. Yeah, that's a more conservative version. So he does yeah. a, a crime and, and gun control bill, which is part of his response uh, to pressure from the right to, to crack down on the riots. Um, but nothing of the significance of the 64 uh, to uh, 66 period. The biggest bill to pass in the final two years is this tax surcharge. Uh, which uh, imposes a 10% tax surcharge to pay for the war in Vietnam, and he cuts domestic spending in exchange. Uh, and again, a lot of the cuts fall on programs like the War on Poverty. That's, that, that was the principal bill of the final two years. Okay, so before we invite our colleagues to talk, uh, to participate, let's talk about what the relevance of this is for today, because you know, there, there are, I mean, very explicitly echoes of President Obama's experience, two years of, of you know, a substantial legislative activity followed by a Republican landslide 
in, in 2010. Do you think Obama was more like Johnson or more different from Johnson? Um, you know, I think he personally is different than Johnson. And uh, it's not so much the schmoozing aspect or his uh, comfort with Congress. It's uh, Johnson came from Congress. So this was a guy who spent most of his life in Washington, uh, who spent most of his life on the Hill, and who had uh, not just relations, but a great sense of the power of Congress. Uh, and so when I say that as president, he always understood the limits of his power. He always used to say, Congress gets the best of every president. And he knew it would get the best of him. That came from his experience and uh, his understanding of how, how the city worked, how the political system worked. Uh, and, and I don't think Obama, obviously, uh, has that same background. Uh, and, and you could argue it's been harmful. But most important, they faced very, you know, when, when Obama did have good circumstances early on, it was a pretty productive moment uh, and shows what a Democratic Congress can do for uh, a liberal president in this day and age. Uh, and when Congress turned on him, uh, he hasn't had much success. But I think it's the conditions that are very different. Johnson had the majorities. Johnson had this huge liberal movement that doesn't exist today, pushing for a lot of this legislation. Uh, and Obama just lacks all those tools, and I think it's constrained him. One thing that, that struck me as a, as a significant difference, too, is that Johnson faced a Republican landslide in 66. Yep. Obama did in 2010, which was followed by redistricting, yep. which meant that the new Republican majorities could lock in the advantages they won in 2010 in a way that amid, you know, in the non-redistricting year, they, they couldn't. Absolutely. And, and so you have a situation now where you can see how structurally it becomes harder and harder for a Democratic president to envision recreating uh, the kind of playing field that Johnson enjoyed without something like reforms to the way we do districting, uh, because it's harder to have a dramatic swing like you had in 1964. Uh, and House Democrat Republicans now keep growing, and it's going to be harder to shift that balance. Well, one criticism you often hear of Obama is that he doesn't use the bully pulpit effectively right. enough, and he doesn't, as you mentioned earlier, schmooze yep. appropriately uh, or successfully uh, or much. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, you, I, I sense from your book yep. that you don't really think that's that important. No, I, I think it's relevant. Obviously, uh, the fact Johnson did all this stuff was not irrelevant, and it's important to have a, the most effective president you can. But you know he could schmooze all he wants with John Boehner, Speaker Boehner, and it wouldn't really make a difference in terms of most of the bills uh, that are being discussed, given the composition of the GOP and now uh, Republican control. Uh, there's only so much in terms of hardball tactics that he would be able to use, and he's tried it uh, to change the voting dynamics on Capitol Hill. So I think that's really an overblown argument, both in terms of the criticism of, of why Obama has failed, but also in terms of understanding why Lyndon Johnson succeeded. That's the connection uh, between the two periods. I think, you know, we always do this with presidents. I don't think he's the only president who we kind of wish somehow just knew how to make the system work better. Uh, we live in an era where Washington seems broken, so we're constantly searching for that leader who will know the magic, and now it's said to be the magic Lyndon Johnson understood, and we continually disappoint ourselves. Uh, and I think we don't pay enough attention uh, to the factors, to the ways in which moments have existed where we've been able to create a Congress that will do stuff. Uh, that's really the question we have to be asking. Well, and, and another difference, I mean, it, it, it's more mechanical, but it, it struck me in, in reading your book, is that, you know, yes, there were filibusters in, um, you know, fighting parts of the great society, but they were exceptional. I mean, that was not the, 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 the norm. Whereas today, it is simply stated that you need 60 votes to get anything through the Senate. That wasn't the case in those days. It's true, but uh, it was pretty bad. So part of what we missed, so it's true filibusters were used uh, much less frequently then. And it was really for high profile measures like civil rights, whereas now you'll filibuster anyone, uh, filibuster a quorum call if you can. Uh, but back then there were other tools that were used, which is part of why filibusters weren't necessary. The committee chairs had so much power uh, 
uh, bills didn't even come up for a vote. There was James Eastland, who was uh, a kind of very racist Southerner, uh, who chaired a subcommittee in the 50s that uh, had power over civil rights, he used to joke that he had special pockets in his pants that were made just to bury all the bills he wouldn't let up for a vote. Uh, so conservatives had other tools then, uh, which at the time liberals hated as much as liberals talk about the filibuster under Republicans. Committee power uh, was really seen as undemocratic, as a kind of noxious part of Washington. Um, so it's important to remember the way a lot of these procedures uh, beyond the filibuster were able to obstruct progress. Okay. This gentleman over here, uh, just wait for the microphone so everyone can hear. Jonathan Roush at Brookings, thank you. It was oh, marvelous. Right. Um, at, at various points you've said Johnson's a great figure, but Congress has an underrated role and that the Times forced their hands. So there are three actors there. Could you just parse a bit more the extent to which you think Johnson's special qualities change history? In other words, if you subtract him from the equation and somebody else is there, how different do things turn out? Right. So that's always the hard question just because counterfactual history uh, is it kind of ripped out of you in graduate school. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as soon as you say that, I can think of all these things that change if you just remove Lyndon Johnson. So the story is just different. Uh, in the end, uh, other presidents, you know, given those majorities and given those majorities with liberals uh, being the dominant voice, many presidents, including a Kennedy, I think could have done pretty well. Uh, I, I think uh, even if they didn't have all the acumen of Lyndon Johnson and all the skills, I, I think those majorities were willing to move on bills. And, 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 and so sending them there, you'd have a pretty good chance of success. Imm and immigration passes in 65, uh, and Ted Kennedy, who had been pushing for this unsuccessfully for years, says, boy, you know, a year ago this would have been impossible. This was easy. Uh, and so in the end, that's the top factor uh, for me, much more than Johnson. My colleague, Calvin Trillin, says yep. the Immigration Bill of 1965 was the single most important development of American cuisine in, <laughs> in, in history because it's where all the Chinese restaurants come from. Okay. Uh, right. it, it's, it's actually true, I think. That's true. Um, but I mean, talk a little bit more yeah. about John F. Kennedy uh, because, I mean, obviously Lyndon Johnson becomes president in fortunately yes. very unusual circumstances. How much of this coalition do you think could have been, I mean, I'm asking you to do the counterfactual thing. Could Johnson, could Kennedy have gotten all this through? I guess that's I think he could have similar. gotten a lot through. I, I think, uh, you know, Kennedy was starting to move by his final years on a lot of these bills finally. Early on, he had been very uh, hesitant to do anything about domestic policy, not just because he didn't care about it, but a lot of his advisors are saying, uh, it's all going to die, because uh, that's what's been happening for over a decade with this Congress. Uh, and the movement forces his hand by 63 with Birmingham, the protests in Birmingham. Uh, Johnson changes his mind. Republicans on the Hill are saying, if you don't you know, support civil rights, we're just going to propose it and take credit away from you. So he moves by that time, and, and the bill is actually moving. Uh, so, so Kennedy's actually moving the bill. Uh, and I think the movement was giving a lot of power uh, to civil rights, and I think if he had remained in office, it would have continued to help drive the legislation. Again, Johnson's moves were important, and I, I don't want to discount what he brought to the table, um, but I think that was a pretty good playing field for the legislation by that point. And then the Great Society, you know, I think Kennedy could have done well. Uh, if you have that many votes, and uh, that, that none of them had to be persuaded to do any of this. They wanted to do this. Uh, I think he could have had success. Again, it's a counterfactual, um, but I, d I think given a lot of respect for Johnson's skills, it, it was the context that really mattered at that moment. And that's why after 1966, you know, it's not like Johnson loses his skills. It's not like Johnson loses the treatment. He could still hover over anyone he wants, and he could still intimidate you and threaten you and seduce you, uh, but he's not getting the same kind of legislation anymore. Once well, the conditions change. But isn't it also true that by 66, 67, he had so alienated the liberal base of the Democratic Party with Vietnam that they were not ready to march behind him in the way that they had before? Or is that not right? I don't think that's totally true. Really? I think on most domestic issues by 67, there's still support. When, you know, when there's cuts proposed to the war on poverty, uh, 
uh, labor, for example, uh, and, and other liberal groups are very upset with this. And they're pushing the administration and standing behind them, don't accept these cuts that conservatives are calling for. So I, I don't think the frame that you see of the Democratic coalition is so severe because of the war in his presidency yet uh, that it, 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 it totally um, kind of diminished what, what he could do. Yes, sir. Oh, wait for the microphone. Hi, my name is Dave Price, a retired educator and journalist who hangs out at New America for potato chips and free, free ideas, okay? So it's Good. a wonder, wonderful thing. Two questions, one in the past, one looking to the future. Um, there's a myth, and, or I shouldn't say a myth, there's, there's a story out there that LBJ took great pride in doing what the boy from Boston, John Kennedy, couldn't do or didn't do. Is there truth to that? How, if so, how much? And the future, certainly Ferguson is not Selma, yet we have this unrest today, but as you point out, and I think you know, so well, it's a whole number of factors that have to come together. Yep. Uh, you don't have the, the religious leadership today necessarily. Um, so for change, what do you see, you know, all, what conditions would need to happen for people who said, we've, we've stepped back on civil rights, we need to come back. What would right. have to happen? Well, Johnson did not, I mean, he, he, he greatly didn't, res he didn't, he didn't respect John Kennedy. And part of what he didn't like was that they didn't use him enough uh, and he thought he was a great asset, and as vice president, he could have helped uh, try to understand Congress, helped to build relations with Congress, and they didn't use him. He also had jealousies about Kennedy being president, and he understood the Kennedy people didn't like him uh, uh, so much, and he felt that he felt uh, so. So all that is all that is true. Uh, and the second, I you know that's that's a harder argument. Part of it about the movement itself. I mean, what's remarkable about the civil rights movement, at least. Uh, is uh, a how broad the coalition was for this legislation if we uh, as we've discussed it included groups that weren't directly affected by civil rights uh, uh, and organized labor is another just it's a great example of this so it had built this big umbrella force uh, behind these specific pieces of legislation I think one of the things also that was different there was specific legislation uh, that was at stake and so the protest at Selma take place with a voting rights bill as the goal. That's what King was trying to get. He wanted that bill to pass. And now I think it's still, at least now, more amorphous than that. Well, and, and I think you know one similarity between the post-Ferguson uh, demonstrations and Occupy, which people hardly can even remember, though it's about two, three years old, is the absence of a clear agenda. For like, for what? I, you know, I mean, you know, people were angry about the Garner case in New York, Ferguson case. Um, so they march to what end? Now, you know, it is true that the catharsis has its own value, but as a political uh, vehicle, it, you know, you just need, I mean, I think you just, you need to be for something. The people in the back, uh, all the way in the back there. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Eugene Mason, and I'm part of uh, American University. And, um, you might already answer this, but um, just more clarification, please. Why did LBJ decide not to run for re-election in 1968? And because of that, I'm thinking about like 2016, how Obama kind of would prefer Hillary Clinton or another Democrat to secede him because then they, they could uphold all the agendas and uh, executive orders. So I'm wondering, did Nixon undo a lot of the things that LBJ did, or and why didn't LBJ uh, try to hold his legacy by keeping another Democrat in office after him? Well, the first question is, LBJ often would tell people uh, that he was not going to run anymore. He was often saying this, uh, but then he didn't do that. Uh, and uh, finally, he makes this decision. He su no one knows about it, by the way. It was a, it was a true surprise, not just to America, when he resigns in March, or he says he's not going to run in the end of March 68. Even his closest advisors didn't know this. Uh, there's a story where his advisors show Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, the speech the morning he's going to make it. And Humphrey just sits uh, on his bed reading this and looks like he's having an anxiety attack uh, when he realizes what's going to happen. Johnson feels defeated. Uh, that's one of the reasons by this point. His approval ratings are horrible. Uh, the party is starting to turn against him uh, very clearly. Conservatives are regaining power. He's not doing what he loves to do anymore, which is domestic stuff, not foreign policy stuff. Uh, and he's fearful that he's going to lose. 
uh, in the uh, uh, primaries uh, in New Hampshire. Eugene McCarthy does better than expected. He doesn't actually win, uh, but it was enough to scare a lot of members of the administration that this might uh, be uh, a, a, an ugly uh, convention uh, and primary season. So part is a sense of defeat. Part of it is a sense that the best way to protect his legacy at that point was to make himself apolitical uh, and to use the final months trying to do something about Vietnam, trying to finish off this guns and butter debate, which is happening right as he decides to resign uh, in more favorable terms to a lot of his domestic programs. Um, and then part of it is concerns about his health that his wife has uh, and kind of what another round of the presidency uh, would do to him. So a lot of factors are at work. I, I just th sometimes think that is an underestimated yeah. term. He, he was physically falling yeah. apart. He had had a heart attack. Yeah. He was smoking yeah. all the time. And he does, in fact, die yeah. on uh, January 25th, 1973, yeah. the day that Roe v. Wade is decided. A fun fact. Yes. Um, and in, and in but, terms of Nixon, who yeah. he'll die uh, well, during that president, Nixon doesn't undo most of the great society. Uh, and that's a pretty remarkable part. In the 68 election, Nixon barely mentions any great society programs. Uh, and a lot of Democrats make fun of him as running this notoriously vague campaign where you literally don't know uh, what he's for or against. Um, and, and the programs will be sustained not only through Nixon, but through today. So, you know, a remarkable part of the great society, which I'm trying to talk about, is even though these windows for uh, legislating are very short, even though this window for legislative success is quick, uh, the programs that pass can endure. And through the age of Reagan, through the age of Bush and conservatism, almost every great society program, other than the Voting Rights Act now, uh, has survived. Uh, and, and so I have in the book, you know, the famous line with the Tea Party protests against Obama's health care program, get your government hands off my Medicare. Uh, which is what concerns are holding. Part of it was funny and ironic, but part of it reflects how ingrained a lot of the great society became well, where and, a conservative and, would defend and it. And one of the big objections to the Affordable Care Act was that it right. would threaten, threaten, uh, Medicare. threaten Medicare, and that's something that you saw in television commercials from Republicans yep. uh, all the time. Yeah. Um, more questions? Uh, Anne Marie? Oh, yeah, this gentleman? Thank you, Glenn Marcus, uh, Media and Governmental Studies, Johns Hopkins University. Um, you mentioned legacy, and if, forgive me, I'd like to go back to Selma for a minute. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you, it's a great film. But there's nothing trivial about issues of the President of the United States and the depiction thereof. Uh, so would you like to talk about what, uh, the, the larger issue of how cooperative Johnson was as opposed to the antagonistic view, which seems to uh, dominate the film? Uh, or maybe even a few detailed things like how the FBI tapes were might have, were ascribed perhaps to him, and how John how um, King uh, you know might have feared some revelations, and that's why he didn't go to Selma, et, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the FBI. So part of it, the F, the, the film, a lot of it is about the FBI and the surveillance of King, and it it, it does come across as if this is a Johnson creation. I mean, you can't come away when it, when it really it was under Kennedy. Uh, that much of this happened. Kennedys were very aggressive in surveillance of Martin Luther King. And, and by the time uh, Johnson's president, it's really J. Edgar Hoover almost as a rogue agent who Johnson is scared of, uh, who's driving uh, the remaining surveillance. So that part of the movie is actually just not true. And I think it really twists uh, the history. The, the other part of this, though, which is bigger, is it's actually a missed opportunity in the film, which is unfortunate because, again, it's a great film. Uh, but you have this moment where you have a president who's not an activist by any stretch, he's a member, of, a member of the political class of America, who had reached a point in his career where he was allied with this very radical social movement of the period. And while he had fears about what he could do, while he still had ambivalence about what should come when, what comes across so clearly in all these conversations with King is he had come to, this president had come to the side of the movement. And he was looking for a cooperative relationship to make this work. That doesn't happen. That's actually a big issue in American politics. We've talked a lot about this with President Obama, uh, where there's been more of a disconnect. How does that happen? How do we get those moments when presidents don't see the movement as simply something to be circumvented, something that was going to cause them problems? Uh, but the movie Selma doesn't do this, because it's about FBI surveillance or about Johnson is portrayed just not as really interested 
in voting rights as he was. You don't get the commitment. Maybe it was the acting, uh, maybe it was the screenwriting, but you don't get the sense of commitment that had happened. And there's plenty of drama with Selma that you don't need to have this kind of depiction of Johnson. Because uh, the drama's on the streets, and it's right there as the movie shows. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not simply one little part of the story. I think the movie would have been even richer uh, to understand how the president had come, come to the side of this cause, which when you see what it meant in the South, was clearly a dangerous position at the time, and still quite dramatic stand for a president of that moment. Um, yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry, wait for the... Uh... Thank you. Uh, Mark Schmidt here at New America. Um, I have w a quick comment. I want to challenge a little bit the assertion that all the great society and war on poverty programs survived. Because, you know, the big ones did, but like the Community Action Agency, those kinds of things didn't. That was the agency that Nixon put Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney yep. in charge of. Um, so in a way, it's like you have the big entitlements and the big rights survive, but the sort of longer term, more patient investments that you needed kind of didn't. And I think that shapes a lot of the some of the some of the backlash uh, later. I guess the the question I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I've, as I've told you before, I'm a big fan of your book on Capitol Hill, uh, which describes kind of the reform of Congress. And from that book, you get a feeling of Congress up until really the early 70s as a super insular place. And you don't feel like there's a lot of, you know, there's not much getting in. And as you, as you note in that, I mean, I remember like the AFL-CIO lobbyist, Andrew B. Miller, is doing the work of like, when I worked on Capitol Hill, there would be like 300 liberal lobbyists doing the work of this one guy. Um, but you're sort of describing a world that sounds a little different from that, where yeah. Congress is a little more open and responsive, even as early as the, as the early to mid-60s, and a world of social movements that seems a lot richer. Yep. I mean, we're used to the story of the big social movement infrastructure really being a late, seven, late 60s, 70s thing, and it feels a little different from yep. the way you're describing it here, and I, I think if you can comment on that a little bit. I think the correct. So there are, uh, uh, there are programs I, I sh uh, that, that get uh, some gutted or some cut. You know, Part of the poverty, Head Start, food stamps, those uh, still remain pretty formidable parts of American life. Uh, but some parts of the poverty program do, do fall away, and that was a loss. Um, uh, in the second part, I think you're absolutely right, and it's part of my own development, I'd say. Uh, I think in, in, in part writing this book, I started to become, uh, to put Congress in a bigger context, which I don't think I did enough of. I mean, on, on Capitol Hill, I try to do it when I talk about congressional reform and try to understand why is there this moment in the 70s when Congress is willing to change the way it does business. And, and part of the answer is the political atmosphere from scandals and from Watergate uh, that make this an actual political issue to do things like campaign finance reform or change the committees. So I was getting at it, but I think in some ways in this book I, I've kind of come around to the impact elections could have, to the impact that social movements can have, and to integrating that more into my work on Congress. And so I think your read is actually spot on. Uh, and, and I think with this story, uh, I'm kind of moving there. It's not that Congress isn't insular in many ways. It is in this period. Um, but there were many pressure points. And on, uh, in these years, you could really see the impact on the Hill. And I wanted to bring that out because uh, it's part of my understanding of the institution now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, wait for the Hi, uh, Mike O'Brien, a civil rights author. I'm yep. wondering if you could expand a little bit more about the fair housing yeah. uh, stuff and, and that bill that was written. Um, what exactly happened? I mean, you gave a little bit of a background, but who actually walked away? Was it the Republicans? Was it the liberal Democrats? Yep. Who walked away? Well, it's proposed in 66. Uh, the conservatives in Congress, the, this coalition, uh, there's no support for it. Uh, this is a civil rights bill gone too far. Everett Dirksen, who's the Republican who helped on the first two bills, says right away, I'm not going to deal on this one. This is not something I want to support. It threatens property rights. The real estate industry conducts a massive lobbying campaign against it nationally, uh, where they're blitzing members of Congress, they're blitzing local communities uh, with arguments that this is going to threaten property rights. Uh, and then on top of that, you have liberal Democrats, uh, including in places like Chicago, uh, who are shaky on this, who are telling the administration, there's great memos in the archives where you know, they do vote counts, 
Uh, and many Democrats who supported them on everything are saying, I'm going to lose my seat. Uh, I can't do this. Uh, and so they are on the fence at best. And so in 66, it dies. Uh, and in 67, it comes back in part because some Republicans in the House, House offer a compromise where they shrink the uh, amount of housing stock that will be subject to these laws. They create exemptions. Uh, that helps move it forward, but it's still stuck from that same coalition. And in 68, it's moving a little. What really changes it is when Martin Luther King is killed, the riots take place afterwards. And it's literally right after the, that uh, that Congress moves forward. But again, it's compromised even further in the final uh, incarnation. And by that point, the big criticism is enforcement was just, it was literally non-existent in the final version of the bill. So it was unclear how this would ever be uh, administered. Uh, but that's, it is that coalition, but, the, but many Democrats, you have to add uh, to that mix on housing. Paul oh. Douglas says, sorry, uh, in that campaign of 66 against Charles Percy, in October of 66, Johnson realizes this guy's going to lose. And it was a shock, because he was one of the kind of great Democrats. And Johnson calls him and says, can I come and can I help? And, and Douglas says, I really don't think you should come, because uh, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help me. And he says, kind of unrest among the working class to this is so bad right now, it's become kind of a toxic environment for both of us. I mean, it just that reminds me of President Obama's non-appearance yes. during the That's last, uh, both 2010 and 2014 midterm elections, where Democrats tell him, stay away. Yes. No, no, that, I mean, that was true. Know, yeah. it, 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 it's just... For Douglas, he wanted to help the president as much of himself. He, he thought uh, it, would, it would harm both of them. Um, these last two questions. Uh, this gentleman back there. All right, go fine. This is fine, whatever. Uh, the person who has the microphone controls it. Uh, we'll get to you next. Yeah. Here's a question you've heard before. What's your take on Caro's Johnson? Caro is a phenomenal writer, and I read all his books uh, uh, very eagerly, and uh, some would argue that our books are, are opposed. And so he is concerned with a figure who understands how to use power uh, like uh, nobody else. Uh, that's at the heart of his book. He can, he can do it in evil ways, early Caro, or he can do it in great ways, uh, mid uh, or current, uh, current Caro. Uh, and I'm focused on, on understanding uh, kind of more broadly uh, why this guy was succeeding. But, but in the end, the books work together. I mean, what I learned from Caro is more than from anyone else about the character of Lyndon Johnson, about the scenes and the kind of in cinematic quality, uh, you know, what happened in those rooms. Uh, and I'm trying to give you the rest of the world uh, that Johnson had to deal with. Uh, I think you need both sides or you don't get a full portrait of what was going on. You could have terrific quotes and these terrific stories about Johnson twisting an arm, but it doesn't explain the big change. So I think they work hand in hand. I, I think you're wrong. I uh, know. I really. I think they are really much more opposed. Okay, and I mean, I, 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 yeah. I felt. I mean, I'm a big Robert Carroll yeah, yeah. fan, and I certainly revere him as a journalist. And yeah. but I think you come away from that book, particularly the last yeah. volume or, or even two, thinking, "What a genius! Only no, he could have done this." And you read your book, and you and you say, "No, that." I mean, you know. You need the votes. I mean, yeah. so I, I, I think they are more contradictory. Than I, you're being too nice. So, uh, yes. Hey, Julian. This is Foz in New America. <clears throat> this is either a really cool money ball kind of question or an annoyingly vague question, which you can declare it. So, you've prop so you properly put the president and the great man theory in its right causal place in the flow chart. Presidents flow yep. from Congress. What's upstream of Congress? What? When you look around in the world, the political environment, what influences the kind of Congresses we have? Is it generational shifts? Is it the economy? Is it immigration? Is it internal migration within the country? Is yep. it all this redistricting? When you, when you see, five, if I actually predict six years out, what kind of Congress will we have, what would you say are the indicators that lead to the kind of Congress we have? Well, predictions are not my strong suit. Uh, but because of you some, you ought to work in cable news. There's no, there's <laughs> right. no accountability for being wrong. So. Uh, <laughs> Just make them anyway. Well, I mean, some of the trends that uh, Jeff talked about earlier, you know, suggest that uh, the trajectory still is toward what we have and more of it. So while you have these demographic changes with immigration that might favor Democrats or 
uh, kind of the uh, intellectual class and how those votes might go to the Democrats. The way districting works uh, and the already built-in incumbency uh, advantage of the GOP would suggest it's going to be very hard and take a long time to undo uh, the current composition, certainly of the House of Representatives. In the Senate, you know, even if control flips, it's not as essential because as Republicans showed, uh, a very organized, disciplined Republican minority uh, can wreak havoc on the Senate, even if they don't have majority control. So if you're looking at the House as the real arbiter of where things are going, right now, uh, I would predict that five, six years, unless you do something dramatic uh, with districting or with pressure within the GOP in these primaries in terms of where you throw money, uh, you're not going to have any sea change. And uh, it might even become more conservative over time, uh, that Republican caucus. So uh, that's where I kind of I see it going. The thing about it, though, let me add, no one saw the 1964 elections coming. So if, if you read things in 62 and 63, all the literature is about how Washington's broken, Congress won't do anything, uh, liberalism might have some victories, but this is about all you're going to get. And then boom, uh, 64 was a big surprise. Uh, this, the, not just the scope, uh, scale and scope of the majorities, but that Barry Goldwater, this guy would run far right uh, on issues that everyone thought were politically suicidal and then lose and make every Republican scared of being another Barry Goldwater. No one saw how that was all going to unfold. So I'm giving you a prediction, uh, but I, I could imagine being totally wrong and kind of some election just shaking the political status quo that way. Please join me in thanking Thank Julian. And even more importantly, please go buy his book. And uh, thank you all for coming.